If you have a a Bible, will you turn back to the passage we read just a a few moments ago in Luke chapter 12 and verse 13. Every day of our lives we are pulled in a number of directions. We have our family responsibilities pulling us one way. For those of us that work, we have our employer and our responsibility of work. We have our obligation towards our friends and wider family. And sometimes even we can feel the obligation of the church pulling us in another. And perhaps we're left wondering from time to time, what is really important in my life? What should I, how do I prioritise things that go on? The passage that we're going to look at this morning in Luke forces us to make a decision about what kind of life do we want? Do we want a life dependent on things of this world or a life with no guarantee of any of the world's goods but close to God? This passage is so relevant for us today because most people that we come across In Britain today, the main priority is to get enough money to live the good life. If you've got Virgin or Sky or any of these TV things and you flick through the channels onto things that you perhaps don't normally watch, you can be bombarded with television shows, things like Lives of the Rich and Famous, fabulous wealthy hideaways. Our magazines tell us You know, just get the next toy and you will be happy. The problem is, someone else has something bigger, better or different. I wonder, even within the church, the difference between comfortable and covetous may not be that great. Jesus in Luke 12 is in the middle of a sermon teaching his disciples to feel God alone, when suddenly he's interrupted by a man who is dissatisfied over what he considers to be an unfair division of his father's estate between himself and his brother. Now, in fact, it was very clear, it was laid down within the Jewish law that the older brother got two-thirds of the estate and the younger brother gets a third. But he wants Jesus to overrule that And so in verse 13, he says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. What he means is, I want 50, 50. Of course, throughout the generations, many families sadly have been destroyed over the simple distribution of assets. We all know the story, where there's a will, there's a family. And this man really doesn't want Jesus to make a decision on what is fair. He simply wants 50% of his father's estate. But Jesus did not answer as perhaps the man expected him to do. Look at verse 14. Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? You see, Jesus refuses to be sidetracked from his mission of seeking and saving the lost. Instead, Jesus does not make a legal judgment, but through this parable, gives a moral one. Jesus knew that the family feud of inheritance was a symptom, not the problem. The ultimate problem was that of greed. Again, it's interesting in verse 14, Jesus uses the word you, a plural term. Jesus perhaps knew his family, knew of the family, knew of the dispute, and realised that both brothers had a problem with greed. And as long as both brothers were suffering from greed, no settlement would be satisfactory. Jesus tells the man an important thing, that to solve the problem... He doesn't need the money, he needs his heart changed. He needs God 
to change his heart. I wonder when I come to prayer, when you come to prayer, how often do we ask God to change our situation rather than asking him to change our heart? Can I suggest that in our individual, even in our corporate prayers, most of our prayers are that God would solve the problem in our lives. Perhaps our prayer should be, God, here is my problem. Please change my heart. In verse 15, Jesus goes on, says to be on guard against all kinds of greed. The area of danger for this man was the greed of covetousness. He wanted more and more. He wanted more and more money. He would never be satisfied however much he had. But it doesn't need to be money. It can be possessions. It can be our time. It can be greed, whatever affects our life. Proverbs 21, 26 says, they are always they, will, they, they are always greedy for more, but have a godly love to give. Or the writer of Ecclesiastes says in chapter 5, verse 10, those who love money will never have enough. How absurd to think that wealth brings true happiness. But if we're honest, isn't that exactly what our society tells us how we should think? If you can just have that bigger house, that nicer car, that pay rise, that dot, 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 then we can live the good life. And we've been sucked into it by our society. Charles Swindle has a picture of it this way. Picture a shipwrecked sailor on a life raft in the middle of the ocean. His terrible thirst implies impels him to drink the salt water, but it only makes him thirstier. This causes him to drink even more, which makes him thirstier still. He consumes more and more salty water until paradoxically he becomes dehydrated and dries. I wonder, are we dying spiritually because we've bought into the concept that we need to consume more and more. Jesus addresses what we can term the folly of seeking a comfortable life. Markham Forbes of Forbes 500 merely reflected our society when he wrote once, the one who dies with most toys wins. Sadly, Mr. Forbes has now passed away and you will know that that statement simply is not true. Beginning in verse 16 is what is referred to as a parable of a rich fool. And Jesus gives us principles of what happens when our hearts are focused exclusively on ourselves. And I want to just look at these very briefly this morning. Verse 16 then, firstly, when our hearts are focused on ourselves, we do not give God the credit for the things he has done. Although it was one individual that came and asked the question, Jesus answers the parable to everyone in the crowd. Jesus speaks the parable to them in a plural way. It's important because he doesn't just condemn the rich man, he wants to speak to everybody, whether rich or poor, in the audience. To the credit, at least, of the rich man, it would appear that he has come by his wealth honestly and he is a believer in Yahweh God. The rich man of his parable we read as a farmer, but in fact he represents all human beings who are reduced by all kinds of greed. As this farmer looked at his amazing harvest, he missed the vital point. He didn't see the hand behind the harvest he didn't see the hand of God. He only saw his own effort. Yet he is a perfect example of greed because he has much and he expects to get more. 
those of us that live in urban cities, I wonder how often do we forget the hand of God behind everything that we have? I'll confess that we, are, we often do say grace um, at home before we eat. We hit the mute button, we say the grace, and we put the mute button back on again. Do we really stop and thank God for our daily provision? I know harvest has gone out of fashion in many churches, but it was a helpful reminder to remind us that the cornflakes we eat, or the Wheatabix, or the toast, or whatever the food that we have, doesn't just come from Sainsbury's, or Waitrose, or Morrison's, or whatever. It comes ultimately from God. Do we focus when we get the pay rise at work on how well we have done this year to deserve it? Or do we see the hand of God behind it? Secondly, if you look at verses 17 to 18, 18, we see that when our hearts are focused on ourselves, we make plans but leave God out. Is this Jesus calling for a radical communist state? Is this Jesus putting a marker down to say capitalism is bad and socialism is good? Well, it's an interesting debate, but it's not found in this passage, and it's something we might want to come back to another time. You see, Jesus doesn't imply anywhere here that there's a, the, the desire to build more barns wasn't both wise and prudent. The problem lies in the fact that there is no thought of sharing it. In the original Greek, the personal pronoun my occurs four times and I eight times. Even in our translation, verses 17 to 18, we see that the pronoun I appears five times and my four times. Notice how he says, my crops, my barns, my goods. He has totally missed the point. He's confused stewardship and ownership. It's not ours to own. And here is the radical thing of Jesus' teaching. The house that you live in is not owned by you. The car that you drive is not owned by you. The money in your bank account is not yours. Genesis 1 to 3 teach us a vitally important lesson that we are called to be stewards, not owners. I wonder if we genuinely believe that the gifts that God has given us, whether it's material or spiritual or natural, are not ours to own, but ours to steward. Does that help us hold them any lighter? Or are we grabbing on to them, thinking, I own this, this is for me? When Jesus says, no, you are a steward of what you have, use it wisely. Thirdly, verse 19 of our passage says, and I'll say to myself, you, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. See, when our hearts are focused on ourselves, we consider spending our resources only on ourselves. You see, this man was only concerned with a physical life. He thought he would put a plan in place and he would be made for years. But all this is based on the fact that this man expected the harvest to continue to keep coming and to continue to keep growing. He thought he had control over the fate of future crops. He envisioned the future as a continually expanding under his control. And we fall into the same trap. My house will always rise in price. My pension will never go down. My savings are safe. And yet we've seen over the last few years, 
but that is not the reality. If you look at James 4, verses 13 to 16, we, we won't read them, but read them later. The Bible does not discourage us from looking to the future with great expectation. In fact, that's what we should do be, looking to the future to see Christ coming. However, we are to make our plans, whether in business or in relationship or in our personal life, from a perspective that ultimately God is in charge. In other words, we need to plan with humility. Again, I wonder what that says to those of us who are slightly older in age, who are either thinking of retirement or are retired. Now, I'm not against retirement. I'm looking forward to it in 20 years' time. But perhaps God looks at retirement differently than we do. Do we see it as a time to put up our feet, to be able to do what we want, to go where we want, to spend as we want? Or do we see it perhaps as God sees retirement, as a time when we have more free income, greater time on our hands than ever before to do some of the kingdom of God's work? Retirement can be sometimes the greatest opportunity to serve God, whether here or in other places. But our passage goes on in verse 20. Jesus says, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. You see, the trouble with this man, fourthly, was that he was storing up treasure in the wrong place. The man is pronounced by a fool, by God. A fool in biblical language is not someone who has a, a mental disability, but is a person who is spiritually undiscerning. According to scripture, a fool is a man who leaves God out of consideration. Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You see, this man is a fool not because he said, but because he lived his life as if God did not exist. He's a fool in that he did not recognize that his material blessings came from God. He did not realize that he had an obligation to use his possessions to honor God. A fool within the Bible is anyone that leaves God out of any area in their life. Sir Fred Catherwood, the former MEP, wrote these words. Greed is the logical result of the belief that there is no life after death. We grab what we can while we can, however we can and then hold it on. We can, then we hold it as hard as we can. Leo Tolstoy once wrote a story about a successful peasant farmer who was not satisfied with his lot. He wanted more of everything. And one day he was challenged by the local landowner. who said, for a thousand rubles, you can buy all the land you can walk around in a day. The only catch is you've got to come back to the starting point before the sun goes down. And so he starts walking and running as far as he can over the land. By midday, he's very tired, but he keeps going, covering more and more ground. Well into the afternoon, he realizes that his greed has taken him too far. So he quickens his pace and he starts for home. But the sun begins to sink low in the sky. He runs faster and faster. He becomes bigger and bigger in his hopes. But as the sun began to sink below the horizon, he came within sight of a finishing line. line. Grasping for breath, his heart pounding, using every last muscle he has, he staggers across the line just before the sun disappears. He collapses, blood streaming from his mouth. In a few minutes, he was dead. Afterwards, his servants dug a grave, six feet by three feet. The title of the book, How Much Land Does a Man Need? 
how much do you need? To be a fool is to have missed the point of life. The remarkable thing is that this person that God calls a fool, we would call a success. He was a successful businessman. He was well known in the neighborhood. He was probably quite well liked. But he was a fool. Jesus said, this very night, your soul will be demanded of you. It will be demanded back. I will take it back. Conveying again the concept that our life is not our own. It's on loan. God decides when we come into this earth. God decides when we will leave this earth. He is in control. Goes on in the second half of verse 20 to say, then who's then those, then who's, sorry, and then those things will be which you have provided. Solomon writing in Ecclesiastes says this, For though I do my work with wisdom, knowledge and skill, I must leave everything I gain to God who haven't worked to earn it. This is not only foolish, but highly unfair. What do we, what, so what do people get? for their hard work. Their days of labor are filled with pain and grief. Even at night, they cannot rest. It is all utter meaningless. You see, you can't take it with you. You know, the Egyptians tried by building their pyramids, by putting lots of possessions in. And thousands of years later, we found them. Everything you have will one day be left behind. It's yours now to use or abuse, but one day God will ask for it back. Do you remember the words of a missionary, Jim Elliot, who says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And then finally, verse 21. When our hearts are focused on ourselves, we will find ourselves in conflict with God's plan for our lives. You've already said riches have one major weakness. You've got no purchasing power this side of death. The rich towards God are those who use God and give them to others. You see, you can be rich with very little money depending on how you use it. Mary, Martha and Lazarus in Luke 10, were rich because they gave to Jesus. The centurion who built the synagogue in Luke 7 for people to worship was rich because he gave it to God. And ultimately, the way we become rich towards God is to invest in his church and the lives of his people. God doesn't require it. He doesn't force us. But God wants us to give willingly, to give sacrificially even for his kingdom and for his glory. And why? So that we will not miss out in his blessing for us. We began this morning by noting that daily we are pulled in many different directions and left wondering what is, the, what is really important in life? Ultimately, the answer is found in verse 21. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Life, in spite of all its complexities, can be reduced to a very simple decision. Are you going to live for yourself, or are you going to live for God? Are you going to use your possessions for yourself or are you going to use it for God? Are you going to take your talents that God has given you and use it for yourself or are you going to use it towards God? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that 
for many of us, we are so maturely well off. You've given us places to live, clothes to wear, food to eat, money in our account. And we thank you for that. And we ask that you would help us to use all that you've given us wisely. We thank you that you've given it to us as a gift to steward and to look after. May we hold it lightly. May you give us wisdom on to know how to use it. And we commit again ourselves afresh to you. Our ambitions, our hopes, our dreams, our work, our leisure, our money, our relationships. Father, may we look to you. May we acknowledge you in everything that we have and in everything that we use. Help us to be thankful for what we have. And may we go from this place living as stewards for you in the week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.